I'm not convinced it ain't no acting or accident with the track emits. You strap with gas that you ain't even practice with. The fact is, you couldn't hit the... Welcome to Three Count Commentaries. Today, we're going to be talking about Monday Night Raw from June the 20th, 2022. All right. So, um, the only note is that Rhea Ripley was removed from the Money in the Bank match with an unspecified medical thing. So she won't be medically cleared um, in time for Money in the Bank. So they're going to replace her. This was the entire crux of the first maybe 40 minutes of Raw. Uh, we got Bianca Belair come into the ring. She was smiling a lot. You know, she smiles a lot. I mean, she smiles a lot. She's very happy. She welcomed everybody to Monday Night Raw. Said she was looking forward to wrestling Rhea Ripley, but then dropped the bomb on us that she would not be medically cleared. And set up the Fatal Five way. This led to, of course, the promo segment where Becky Lynch says so she's the only contender. She's been wanting a one-on-one rematch. Oscar uh, called her a big-time baby. Uh, Becky says that the last two times they wrestled, it was Oscar who was the one who's got beat. So maybe she should stop making Simpsons memes and uh, and trying to annoy her and take this more seriously. And uh, Liv Morgan came out there and said that she's always ready for a fight. And she's already in the Money in the Bank match, but she'll gladly trade that in for an actual one-on-one match at Russell, at uh, Money in the Bank. Carmella says that she don't even know why Liv is here. Everybody here is a champion. And Liv only got to this position and in the Money in the Bank because she was riding on Alexa Bliss's coattails. Alexa Bliss comes out there and says that Carmella cannot be successful on her own. And that if she doesn't leave Liv Morgan alone, she's going to beat her in the face and some other stuff. I absolutely hated this opening segment. I hated this. I hate when they have the everybody comes out one at a time promo. I, I, I don't like that. It's like all of you were just standing back there waiting for your name to be dropped or something. And to me, it's just, ugh, ugh. Anyway, I, I, I can't stand it. I like Bianca Belair. Though. Everybody knows I'm a Bianca Belair mark. I'm a mark for her. Um, I don't dislike anybody in this match, though, except maybe Carmella and Liv Morgan. And then Liv Morgan, it's not even Liv Morgan. It's her fan base that I hate so much. But I am, I got to admit, y'all, I'm tired of Becky Lynch and Asuka. I'm tired of it. It's been like a month of straight of them. I can't be the only one. Now, I know that Bianca Belair probably has had the, is cursed as the champion. I don't think anybody has had more canceled matches than Bianca Belair. She was supposed to wrestle Sasha Banks. Sasha Banks no show because she didn't get vaccinated or something like that. She was supposed to wrestle Bailey. Bailey broke her leg, so she didn't get that match. She was supposed <laughs> she was supposed to be wrestling Naomi. Naomi walked out, so we didn't get that match. Now she was supposed to be wrestling Rhea Ripley, and Rhea Ripley has undisclosed small pox, monkey pox, or some shit. I'm not saying she has that. I'm just you know talking shit. But she's not going to be in the match either. So it's like, damn, whenever Bianca Belair is the champion, it seems like people just start getting sick. They start getting injured. You know, it's just like all kinds of stuff. that's ruining everything. This is the second month, second, second pay-per-view event where Bianca Belair's opponent had to be changed on the fly. Uh, but he had the Fatal 5-Way number one contenders match, and Carmella wins the match. And I instantly groaned because we've seen... Bianca Belair beat Carmella 10,000 times on TV. You might as well have just said, well, Rhea Ripley is hurt, so I uh, don't know what we're going to do. We're going to cancel it or we're going to do something else. <laughs> you know, literally anything else. Because Bianca Belair versus Carmella is not interesting. Carmella wasn't gone long enough to wash away all of the losses that she's had. She wasn't gone away that long. You know, and she's coming back as the exact same character too, so it doesn't, it doesn't help. Now, Liv Morgan and uh, and Alexa Bliss, putting them in this match, the only purpose you would put them in there is because they're winners, and they won last week, but they're already in the Money in the Bank match. Like, we, we literally couldn't find four other women to use. You know, like, we didn't need Oscar or Becky Lynch, especially since they're going to be wrestling in the main event. And we didn't need Liv Morgan and Alexa Bliss, but we got all of them anyway. But I guess the only options you had were Dewdrop and uh, Nikki. And you know what? Maybe they aren't the best options. So I guess they, I guess they did the best they could with what they had. Becky Lynch had a, uh, went over to Adam Pearson and complained that Oscar pulled the leg out of 
pulled her leg out of the ring when she had the pin. And uh, she's demanding the number one contender spot and say that there cannot be a money in the bank without her because she's on the poster. Oi, I'm on the poster. I'm on the poster. I'm on the bleeding poster. And uh, Adam Pierce doesn't care that she's on the poster because he's like, I, I don't know about that. that well, that's graphic design. That's different. De- that's a different department. Um, anyway, uh, he makes it reofficial that Becky Lynch is going to wrestle Oscar, but it's going to be two nights. And Becky Lynch complains again because she just wrestled in a match and she doesn't want to have to wrestle another one. But the, the choice is not hers. And Becky Lynch and Oscar main event raw again for what seems like the third week in a row. It feels like it's been a, well, I know they didn't main event last week, but it felt like it did. <laughs> so, um, Oscar wins with a roundhouse kick to the head. They really getting over Oscar's kick. It was a shoot. She landed two good ones on uh, Becky tonight. And, uh, she pinned her and Becky Lynch is really showing you a lot in terms of being able to lose and not lose your heat and not lose your importance. Cause she's been losing a lot since she's been big time Becky, you know, this new gimmick is just so obsessed with being, it's so whiny and so obsessed with being a winner and everything that she's unfocused. And because she's unfocused, she's losing a lot more than she probably should have. She's not in her bag. And, um, you know, losing to Carmella earlier is akin to losing to Dana Brooke a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and losing to Oscar. So Oscar's going to be in the money in the bank match. And it probably will be a money in the bank without Becky Lynch. So Becky Lynch threw an absolute tantrum, tore up everything on the side. She actually started crying. She's, she's brutal. She's in a bad state of affairs out here. Poor Becky. We're supposed to feel bad for Becky. Um, I give Becky some credit. She's a huge star for the, for the female division and for them to not just default and put her in the match. It takes great restraint from WWE. They obviously is doing something with Becky that they're trying to really get over and they're being very disciplined in their writing. And, well, you know, which is very rare because we're going to talk about this in a moment about them not being disciplined. But um, they've been disciplined in their writing because they clearly didn't have any plan to put Becky Lynch in the Money in the Bank match. And they're not going to knee jerk and do it just because somebody got hurt. You know, they're not going to completely change everything just because somebody got hurt. They're sticking to whatever story is that they're trying to tell with big time Bex and how her being completely unfocused um, and being a big baby and a big whiner. You know, they're sticking to it. Um, Oscar has zero chance of winning the Money in the Bank. As far as I'm concerned, um, Oscar uh, actually teased a character change on Twitter, believe it or not. Um, but it's, I guess, has not come to pass and probably will not come to pass, at least no time soon. So, unfortunately for us, um, we kind of stuck with Carmella as the opponent for Bianca Belair. Um, if you're a Carmella fan, shame on you. I don't know what you got to be a fan of, actually. Carmella is better than she, you know, people give her credit for, but she's not very good. She's not great at all. We got a surprise uh, from Vince McMahon, who strolled out there. Once again, got a hero's welcome. Once again, people saying no chance in hell. Once again, people bowed to him. He came out there and uh, thanked everybody for all the years of Raw, you know, for you know participating and being there. This is the 1,517th episode of Monday Night Raw. It said it's one of the longest, the longest running episodic program in television. And the last 20 years, 20 of the last 30 of the 30 years of Raw has been dominated by the greatest superstar of all time, John Cena. We'll be making his re-debut next week. Everybody cheer John Cena. Vince kind of looked shitty getting out of the ring. <laughs> He's 76. And then the the boss leapt down the stairs. <laughs> he leapt down the stairs and caught himself on the banister. But he was proving that he's no Joe Biden. Joe Biden can't ride a bike. But Vince is jumping off these goddamn steps and everything. He's out here trying to prove a point. Obviously, once again, Vince triggered the world by showing up on Raw. And now they're super mad. They're big mad. They're big dumb mad. They were really mad on, on SmackDown. They were really angry. But now they're big dumb super mad. Like they're 
I'm talking steam coming out of their ears. Like, how dare he? Why don't he just go away? It's like, man, what are you talking about? <laughs> I hope he shows up on NXT, goddamn. I hope it's the first face you see. Because I know NXT has taped, so he's not going to be there. But I hope they uh, superimpose Vince like, then, now, forever, together. And, you know, it's his face, you know, telling us something we already know. <laughs> you know, like, he's just out there, you know, doing his rounds. And I, I I do love all the pontificating from Vince. I saw some, I saw so many people say, somebody flatly wrote uh, that his SmackDown speech was his version of a Trump rally. I just looked at that thing and was like, <laughs> I can see how it would be a political rally. I can see that. I can, I can, I can dig how that might be the case. But a Trump rally? Wouldn't that be a rally in general? Like, aren't all rallies the same? You know, political rallies are almost always the same thing. Why is it specifically a Trump rally? You know. It's just, these people are just so out of pocket. They're so angry. I love that Vince pisses them off so much, though. He's trolling. He's top tier trolling these motherfuckers, man. He's trolling these dudes hard. All right, let's get into... <laughs> Riddle comes out there. He's still doing this whole Randy thing. And um, he said that he made a promise that he was going to get vengeance for Randy. And that he can't challenge Roman Reigns again, but he can win the money in the bank. Um, he also called Seth freaking Rollins a scumbag for jumping Cody and hitting him in this torn peck. MVP came down to the ring, says that uh, Riddle must have got the top show stash from Snoop Dogg or Smoke Dizza. And I'm like, Smoke Dizza? You know, the last time I ain't heard Smoke Dizza's name in 10 years. I literally have, I was probably the only person I know that listened to Smoke Dizza. And I haven't listened to him in a decade, at least. Um, Weed Raps is my favorite song. I posted it on Twitter. You should go listen to it. It's Smoke Dizza, DZA, like Rizza from the Wu-Tang Clan. Um, he did a song called Weed Raps. It's pretty good. Um, it was from the, I think it's the Coney tape. Ooh. I had the first couple of tapes that he made. He's a big wrestling fan, too. So, I tweeted out that he's probably thrilled that, um, you know, he got mentioned on Raw by MVP. But that's inside baseball for some people who might not recognize that he's a rapper. He's been around for a long time. Um, anyway, they made some jokes about getting high and, um, then they had the match, uh, and Amos wins. Amos beat Riddle. They, they had, they, it, it came up with a pretty good excuse. Riddle just wrestled Roman Reigns and got speared and, you know, pretty much got hurt and his ribs were still taped up. So he couldn't beat Amos. Um, he tried though. He put up a pretty good fight and, um, so many, so many people got so, I mean, people, of course, knee jerk whenever somebody loses. So Riddle lost to Amos and all of a sudden he's buried. He's buried. He's dead. He's, you know, whatever. But if you were paying attention, obviously you were supposed to get sympathy for Riddle because he just had a, this grueling match with Roman. He nearly won. He got speared out of the air, landed on his rib cage, injured. Now he's got to wrestle this giant. You're supposed to feel bad for him. And, the, the general idea is people want Riddle to, to overcome the odds and win, you know, and yes, I, I get that. My thing is Riddle shouldn't even have been in this match because he cannot challenge for the title again. That should include money in the bank. He can't challenge for the belt again. All right. That's the thing. Like maybe he could wait for Roman to lose it, I guess, but he shouldn't even been in this match. You know, he should be sitting back trying to think of other ways to to gain revenge on Roman. And in the old days, the best way to gain revenge would be for, you know, Roman to be in in the 15th minute of a long, grueling match. And then Riddle come out of nowhere and knee him in the side of the head, hit him with a chair or something like that and cost Roman the belt. That would be the old school way of handling it. You know, but they don't do that kind of stuff anymore because... Who, heaven forbid somebody might actually get over so he just gets put in this match and he loses to Amos everybody trips out because he lost to Amos instead of thinking about it you know maybe Amos kind of needed a win but at the same time I'm looking at this thing like we didn't need Amos in this ladder match 
I don't like the whole giant and a ladder match thing. I think it's stupid. It's the silliest thing WWE insists on doing is we got to have one of everything in a ladder match. It's like Noah's Ark. You know, well, that's two of everything, but you get my drift. You know, we got to have, you know, the diversity. It's got to be in there. So we got to have Kane in the ladder match. You got to have Big Show in there. Like, no, we don't. Like, these fucking guys, what what are they going to do in the ladder match? Except come up with some kind of crazy kooky ladder, like Big Show's giant ladder that uh that support his weight. And it was ridiculous. Like, that's the only thing those things are for, you know? Because Giants never win a ladder match. So what the hell is the point of them even being in it? It just makes them look silly. Um, I'm not a fan of this Omos thing. MVP is doing his best, but Omos is coming across very generic. He used to be kind of cool. He used to have a cool factor to him, but that's seemingly gone now. In in exchange, what is left behind is generic roaring giant, and that's terrible. It's awful. It makes him the great Kali in blackface, and I can't stand it. It sucks. Do better. Amos was actually not bad when he was with AJ Styles. You know, he sucks now. Seth Rollins sauntered out there. He danced and pranced and then beat the hell out of Riddle. Then says that he said, I don't share airspace with losers. Then he set the stage, which tells us what's going to happen next. That um, even if Riddle had won, he wasn't going to win money in the bank because nobody... There is nobody who could beat Roman except him. And that he is the only man who has Roman's number. And that Roman has been ducking him. And that money in the bank, after he gets the money in the bank, he's going to go find him. And uh, Riddle tries to fight him back and ends up getting beat up again. But they're setting the stage that Seth Rollins is likely going to be the winner of the money in the bank match. And they're going to tease him cashing it in again. On Brock and Roman. And they're going to tease him. Cashing it in on Roman. And being the guy. The only guy who can beat Roman. You know. And I like that. You know. He's going to be Roman's kryptonite. In a sense. And I always thought they went away too fast. From the whole Royal Rumble thing. Like. They had one match. Six months ago. Five months ago. And. They never went back to it. They just kind of moved on. And started doing other stuff. You know. Like. Oh, yeah, you you did win by disqualification. Anyway, uh, you know, go ahead and go on your losing streak to Cody. It's like, okay, that was weird. Very weird. I love me some Seth Rollins, though. I wouldn't mind it if he won, but I don't think he needs it, you know. I think Seth Rollins has been doing really good and adding extra accolades onto him, you know, unless it's going to be for a really good storyline purpose. I just don't see the reason why he needs to win it. That's just me personally. Austin Theory is out there. He's got a podium in the U.S. title. He talks about being the new chosen one and a prodigy. Nobody in this company can touch him because he's on different levels. Uh, He says that everybody is so so excited about Cena coming in, but Cena's time is up and his time is now. And that he came out here with a podium because he didn't get to do his full pose down the previous week. So he's going to do it again. So he's got some baby oil. He oiled himself up and then uh, ordered the music to play. He's got a, he's wearing a headset. So <laughs> he can do his, uh, his poses without having a cur- handle with a microphone. Um, some people are irrationally angry about the pose down and not really getting at the, the point of it, which is that this kid is extremely cocky, you know, and, He's really just trying to show off. It's all about, you know, aesthetics with Austin Theory. So he's doing a pose down at Covered in Oil. Um, he's getting some really good heat from the crowd. He's messing with them and, you know, it's working. He starts doing his selfie and Lashley sneaks up behind him in the dark. And he turns around, Lashley sprays oil in his face and spears him. He flops out of the ring. Lashley then tells him, I'm not asking, I'm telling you, you're going to defend that United States Championship against me. So Theory is upset. He goes and he says, oh no, he doesn't deserve it. Lashley don't deserve no goddamn United States title match. But he'll give him one if he can win in a three-man gauntlet on this show. 
So Lashley defeats Chad Gable, Otis, and Austin Theory. Uh, he had a very good match with Chad Gable. I I thought for a moment that he might get hurt on Gable's moonsault because he wasn't looking. He didn't like he was completely ready, and Gable landed right on his uh his bicep. He landed right on uh, Lashley's bicep, and I was like, oh, I hope he didn't tear his bicep or something like that. But it seemed to be okay. Um, the he wrestled Otis, went into the disqualification as uh, Chad Gable jumped in the ring to help. Alpha Academy beat Lashley down, and Austin Theory tried to pick the bones. Um, he went for his silly finisher maneuver, which I hate. I hate Austin Theory's finisher. And Lashley cradled him to a win. It was a great visual, you know, in terms of a uh, counter. But I do hate that he pinned Austin Theory already. You know, again, what are we paying for here? I mean, they've already given it away. Um, so Theory will be wrestling last year at Money in the Bank. That's fine. I expect Austin Theory to win because I expect him to 50-50 book that. And I'm expecting Cena and Theory to be a United States title match. That's what I'm thinking it's going to be. That's me personally, though. It only makes sense for Theory to beat Lashley if he beats Cena. And I'm not certain he'll beat Cena. I'm not certain at all that'll actually occur. But I'm actually interested in uh, Cena and Theory. But we already know Bobby Lashley should not be wrestling Austin Theory anyway. He should be wrestling Roman fucking Reigns. That's who he should be wrestling, not Brock Lesnar. Because... We know that Bobby Lashley was the ECW champion. We know that he was a TNA World's champion. We know that he wrestled at Slammiversary, wrestled at uh, Bound for Glory, he wrestled at WrestleMania, he wrestled on, e- wrestled on ECW TV, he wrestled in the Extreme Elimination Chamber match, he, he, he wrestled John Cena in the main event of Great American Bash, he wrestled Drew McIntyre, he wrestled uh, Sheamus, he, uh, he had the matches with uh, MVP. He had the great matches with Apollo Crews. I mean, he just had all of these excellent matches with all of these great guys, man. And it's like, but he, what does it take? Uh, Lashley already beat Brock Lesnar. I mean, what the fuck? He should be wrestling Roman Reigns. Let's fucking go. You feel me? What is? What's taking so long? Why they want? Why they want just do what I asked them to do? Just do the thing. I asked you to do the thing. Just do the thing. Shit. Got a little bit more character development. Miz TV featuring AJ Styles. Uh, Miz is messing with AJ Styles because he buddied up with Finn Balor, who then turned on him and joined the Judgment Day, even though there's been zero repercussions for that. And guess what? Judgment Day wasn't even on this show. How about that? They weren't even on this show. I'd just be damned. Yes, I heard that Edge is hurt. So maybe that's why the Judgment Day was... Uh, I don't want to say ditched, but why they was changed because Edge is apparently injured, legitimately injured. And um, Finn Balor was put in there to take his spot, but now they have zero creative plans for them because no sooner than they took Edge out, they had no creative plan for him the next week. They used Rhea Ripley. Now Rhea Ripley is out. Fuck! This thing is snake bit. It's almost as bad as I hate to put it like this because I saw so many people say it and I was like, y'all cringe for saying that, but it's like retribution. Like retribution was snake bit from the beginning. You know, it's like all kind of bad shit started happening. And it's like judgment day has been going on for two weeks without edge. It's been nothing but bad shit. Edge got hurt. They killed that angle. You know, now Rhea Ripley is hurt, killed her angle. They're not, they refuse to go further with the AJ Styles, Finn Balor thing, which I think would have been natural for them to have a conversation about that. Instead, you know, AJ Styles kind of addressed it here. They haven't confronted one another or anything about it. They just kind of moved on. Um, Miz said that he was embarrassed for AJ Styles and that, you know, he he, he brought him out here to show these kids, these college students, what it's like to be a failure. AJ Styles says, look, he's not a failure, but he's been through some adversity. And how, how do you think he became phenomenal? And that was a got a pretty good clock because people kind of felt that they were like, yeah, that's how you become phenomenal. You lose until you, until you win and you learn to win and you gain momentum from winning. I get that. It's a very good, you know, uh, life lesson there about not being afraid to fail. 
So then Ciampa attacks him from behind, and AJ Styles is pretty upset about that. He doesn't like that at all. But um, this was after AJ Styles punched the Miz in the face, or he bopped him in the head with the microphone, one of the two. Um, there's a lot of talk about Miz's balls, and I, I feel like we, did, we didn't need too much conversation about Miz's balls on a three-hour show. You know, we didn't need that. Uh, Ciampa was defeated by AJ Styles, which led everybody to believe that Ciampa is dead, and he's going to be buried, and, you know, all this kind of stuff. But I noticed that they're basically attending to do something with Ciampa and Miz. That maybe uh, they're going to pair those two together. And Ciampa's going to be Miz's bodyguard or something like that. And that would be sweet. You know, because Ciampa have a bodyguard that's smaller than he is. <laughs> well, shorter than he is. Because Ciampa is ripped. He looks like an adult man. Who like he's been in a fight. He's like he might fight bears, you know. So, that was very nice. Okay. Um, Zeke and Elias. They did the thing. This was awesome. Zeke and Elias rules. This rule. This was really great. So, they did the old uh, the old trick where Zeke and Elias were sitting on the couch far away from each other. And Zeke tell, is telling Elias all about his adventure and becoming a WWE superstar and getting entangled with this whole Kevin Owens business. And Elias is telling Zeke about his going around the world, playing in shows. And um, he says, he's a changed man. You know, he's, he's really proud of Zeke and saying that, um, you know, seeing how far Zeke have gone. But he said he was concerned that such a wholesome man as Zeke wouldn't have the killer instinct or the mean streak to succeed in WWE. At this point, I was I was dead, bro. I was dead. Zeke was talking about getting all Zeked up about winning the WWE title and the Zeke freaks, and it was just all hilarious. This was my favorite segment of the night. It, I, I, I'm almost ashamed to say it, but this was the Three Faces of Foley segment that they've done, but it was even more elaborate and retarded because of the fake, the obviously fake beard that Elias had. Yeah, how like he has never been so well groomed. It was just such an obviously weird, obviously fake beard. But it was so funny because they were on the screen at the same time having a conversation, and Zeke, as usual, was getting all emotional and getting you know really deep down and introspective about you know how their parents might be looking down on them and being so proud of what they've done and everything and. At the end, they fist bump each other. And I'm like, this, is, this shit is very wholesome. Like, Ezekiel is the most wholesome character on in pro wrestling right now. He cares about his family. He cares about his friends. You know, he has all these great memories of being a superstar, or wanting to be a superstar, and all this kind of stuff. It's really good. You know, it's really good. So... I saw a lot of people getting upset about this. They don't like it, but I'm telling you, this shit is great. So we get Elias in the ring, plus his obviously fake beard. And he's trying to talk in a way where the beard won't get knocked off his face or anything like that. So before he gets a chance to play a song, Kevin Owens interrupts, says that nobody wants to hear this concert and knows that it was special effects that allowed him and Zeke to be on the screen at the same time. And he even said that he watched a dinosaur fly a airplane in a movie because he knows how special effects works. Um, so he knows that Zeke just did special effects. Uh, Zeke popped up on the trine and said that, uh, look, it's been proven. Elias is in the ring. I'm here. You know, it's time to move on. Uh, then Elias sung a song saying that KO was a liar. Kevin Owens snatched the guitar and threw it out of the ring to which Elias kneed him in the face and then hit him with a guitar from behind. At the end of it all, uh, Kevin Owens stumbled to the back where he had another meltdown and decided to challenge either Zeke or Elias to a match or Elrod, their third brother, who apparently only Kevin Owens knows. <laughs> And they ran with the L rod thing and just added it to the <laughs> It's so ridiculous. And they added them to the to the options. Like you don't even know what L rod is. What's going on here? Anyway, um this was great. This was great. Kevin Owens is smart enough to figure out everything. 
But, you know, everybody's supposed to be playing along. And, you know, they've done this stuff in wrestling before. And people get, they take WWE way too seriously. You know, like, when the Junkyard Dog did the whole thing with Stagger Lee, it was, obviously, he was, everybody knew who it was. That's the thing. And that's the fun part, is that the the heel thinks they figured it out, but he can't prove it. So, the babyface gets to keep playing tricks and keep playing games. And I thought Kevin Owens was going to go in there and snatch off his beard. That's what I thought was going to happen, or try to pull it, pull on the beard. Like, he was going to go in there, talk to him for a little bit, banter with him, and just like, what's up with your beard? And kind of reach for the beard and Elias will just move his head back or something like that. Like, just to play on it, to give people the idea that he's wearing a fake beard and that Kevin Owens notices that he's wearing a fake beard. Like, for them to not acknowledge the fake beard at all, was was a misstep. And that was one small misstep. But otherwise I loved everything that involved Elias and Ezekiel. It was tremendous. You know, it had good storytelling, it had sympathy, it had heart, it had comedy, you know. So I, I dig it, man. This they're making this thing work. And there was people, podcasters that you guys really like, that wanted this guy fired. Yeah, they did not like the drifter. They didn't like him in the next city, one of them gone. I'm telling you, people don't know talent. They have no taste for talent. Okay, the last thing is, was this Veer cutting a promo? Uh, Fear Veer and his, uh, his new way of speaking. I love carnage. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> well... At least he's not barking and growling and shit. You know, he's uh he's talking in a fairly normal voice. They also dumped in some Hindu or whatever, Hindi or whatever language he speaks just to get the booze because, you know, Americans don't like to hear other languages. We don't want to hear that. It's bad for the ears. The WWE has never seen hunger like mine. I cannot be stopped. I will not be stopped. I was like, Veer! Come on, man. Get to the point. Please get to the point. Um, this this promo made it painfully obvious what WWE tells people not to acknowledge the cameras. And I look, I, somebody uh there's a new Twitter account, uh Out of Context See It. You know, it's along the same lines as Out of Context Dusty or Out of Context Flare, where it's basically just like the most random see it stuff. If you can watch see it promos where he's standing at the camera, the master and the ruler of the world. Everything about that was so good. I love see it. See it fucking rules. I can't imagine see it being any good. He can't stare at the camera. I just can't imagine that. See, WWE has such such ridiculous rules that I don't even understand what the what the hell the purpose of those rules are. You know, like don't acknowledge the camera. Like, why not? Like, give me one good reason why looking at the camera is bad. Like, people did it for 40 fucking years, guys, talking to the camera. And nobody died. And nobody, you know, caught on fire or anything. Now, all of a sudden, niggas can't talk to the camera no more. Like, could you, could you imagine telling Randy Savage he couldn't talk to the camera? He had to stare at Mean Gene Oakland the whole time he cut his promo. Why? He's not talking to Mean Gene Oakland. He's talking to his opponents. He's talking to the people. You know, I'd have broke that fucking rule. I'd have been staring at the camera all day. Like, I love carnage. <laughs> I never got, I can't believe he said that. <laughs> I love carnage. <laughs> Holy shit. Um, but they were at the Oakland position, so that was really good. I like that. Um, overall, the show was okay. The women did the bulk of the work. Um, they're kind of weighing everything else down. Like the street profits and the Usos are making too much contact. There's too many singles matches between the two of them. There's no tag team division. Um, Lashley having to beat Austin Theory made no sense. They should have brought out somebody else. Um, this. It's, I hate that. That whole he had to beat Austin Theory to get a shot with Austin Theory. It's stupid. It's stupid. 
The Fatal Five Way was okay. The main event was great. You can't go wrong with Oscar and Becky Lynch wrestling each other, except for the fact that you know you might not want to see it for the four hundredth time. WWE knows how to take a good thing and run it into the ground. You know, they did that with Riddle. Riddle was fun. He's funny. It's cool to make those little allusions to him being high. But when you overdo it, it's it's overdone. And now we got too much. Now we got too much. When we make an obscure uh, callback to like Smoke Dizzle, it's like, come on. We're going too far. You know, let's let's move on to something more substantive. Um, but WWE's very thin roster is, is really showing again. You know, their inability to utilize talent. Not that they don't have it, just that they have an inability to utilize it, which doesn't seem to make sense in the grand scheme of things because you would think a thinner roster with Randy Orton going down and Aurea Ripley going down, more opportunities would be open and you would create more opportunities. But it seems like you're just going back on old faithfuls. And, you know, Car- the Carmella thing was like, oh, well, Carmella is, uh, we know how she can, she can go in there and do the job and it's no big deal. It's like, okay, but how about we try somebody else and try something else? Bring somebody up from NXT is a perfect time for it. We don't know how long she's going to be gone. Now, she's only going to be gone for two or three weeks. Okay, maybe you don't want to bring in somebody just for that. But you could have done something that's going to be a lot more fun and a lot more interesting than, hey, all the same people wrestling again. Like, all these, most of these people wrestled each other a couple of weeks ago. You know, like this division is too small for everybody to have so much contact with one another. But I still think that Liv Morgan is kind of a shoe in for the women's money in the bank, at least for right now, either her or um, Lacey Evans. And I think they're making it a, little, a lot more obvious now that Seth Rollins is winning the men's money in the bank. Uh, I'm, I don't like the idea of Seth Rollins winning the men's money in the bank because I don't think he needs it, you know, even for his character. I don't think he really needs it. But I guess we'll see what the plan is, you know, so like, share and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later, man. Uh, Peace out.